Well, good afternoon. Uh, if afternoon is where you are, right? It's uh, one o'clock here in Washington. Uh, maybe for some of you it's morning uh, or it's evening, uh, but uh, glad that you're spending some time with us for the next hour. Um, so uh, let me tell a little bit about myself, uh, but first I want to acknowledge um, the situation uh, that you are all in. Um, you're back, many of you from Malaysia. Uh, this was a very abrupt return back to the United States, certainly unexpected. Um, I know you've been meeting as a community uh, up to now, which I think is fantastic. Um, so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about what that feels like and, and, and how you're doing with regard to that. Um, and focusing more on advancing your career and what comes next, but um, we can also talk about how you're feeling and how you're doing right now. Um, I am based in Washington, DC. I was a US Fulbright scholar oh, about 16, 17 years ago. I was a college professor at the time and I taught in Estonia. And since then I've been uh, very involved in the Fulbright Association, the national office, but I'm also on the, the Washington DC, the NCAC board. Um, I teach uh, part-time at George Mason and at Drexel University. My field is conflict resolution. So most of what I teach is conflict resolution and peace building. Um, I've written a couple books. I've written a book on careers called Peace Jobs. I also, if you're, if you're a member of, of FA and you're getting the newsletter, I write a column in there on careers uh, every time the edition comes out. So um, I've, I've worked a lot with Fulbright communities, uh, with uh, returning Fulbright uh, grantees. Um, uh, many of you are coming back and trying to figure out what's next. And, probably you were thinking uh, that conversation wouldn't happen as quickly as it did. And so we wanna talk a little bit about that. So let me uh, start off by setting the stage a little bit. So uh, I was thinking about who you are uh, versus who I was and your circumstance. And um, this paragraph actually may reflect many of you. Here I am in rural Malaysia, teaching English to a group of middle school aged children. I have all kinds of activities and projects lined up. I'm really enjoying living in my community and with the local family. The local culture is vibrant and fascinated, fascinating, and I've been invited to a wedding. I'm working with my Malaysian colleague to learn more Malay, which was one of my objectives during my Fulbright experience. I'm thinking about starting a blog. This is really the experience of a lifetime for me. I feel like I'm making a difference in the world. Then coronavirus arrived. And um, I would suspect that paragraph is probably something that kind of where you all were, you know, a month ago, right? And um, that kind of abruptness of changing and dashing a lot of your expectations. And um, we want to talk a little bit about that at some point uh, in the next hour. But um, I think there's commonality, not only amongst yourselves as being uh, mostly ETAs uh, that were off to Malaysia, but the entire Fulbright world, uh, many people have come back, if not most have come back, um, and are kind of dealing with these dashed expectations and really changed plans. I was thinking about, you know, emotions that you might be feeling. I'm really disappointed, and that, that actually might be a, an understatement for many of you. You know, you had, think about, you're thinking about how much work it took to apply for a Fulbright, right? And how I thought about this for several years and how I talked to other Fulbright grantees and how exciting it was uh, to, to, to go on a Fulbright experience. And, and now I'm really disappointed because it's not the experience I had, I had planned. Uh, this is really crazy. I should have been able to stay there, right? So some of you might be thinking, and I think in some circumstances, some Fulbrighters might have stayed in their country, but, and I don't know what that means for their grant, but this idea that um, there wasn't much coronavirus there and now there's coronavirus here. Uh, a lot of people who come back from overseas are kind of dealing with that. And, and oft, often thinking, well, you know, I could have, could have done a lot of work, uh, you know, even with this going on. So that, that kind of feeling also. I'm mad at everyone. Uh, and, and I'm wondering how many of you are feeling that also, that you're kind of, you're mad at the Fulbright program, uh, you're mad at coronavirus, whatever that means. Uh, you're, you're just mad. It's, it's kind of this anger you're feeling and you're trying to 
do something with. It's really frustrating right now. So, you know, kind of as you kind of go through that disappointment and that anger, um, then sometimes there's a sense of just really frustration, right? Just, just not knowing what to do, right? And you just can't shake it. You know, every morning it's like, okay, what is it that I'm supposed to do today? So that frustration kind of sets in. I feel lost. I don't know what to do now. So if you had kind of planned out that this time, you this time and for the next several months, for the nine months that you would have been in Malaysia, you would have been teaching, uh, you weren't really thinking about a plan B, probably, right? Plan A was Malaysia, there's no plan B, right? So you've come back and there's some uncertainty about that. Uh, I'm feeling depressed and anxious, maybe I should seek professional help. And I would say yes, definitely. If you're feeling depressed and anxious and it's, uh, you know, interrupting your day and it's causing you to kind of dwell on things that uh, you shouldn't be dwelling on or things that are just kind of just too troubling for you, then you should. And, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, the ability to do telemedicine and lots of conversations you can have and lots of support groups that are out there. So really, you should do that. I'm back in my parents' home, which is not what I expected, right? So I imagine a number of you are back in your parents' home, and that is just not what you planned. Uh, maybe you'd planned to, to come back, uh, finish your Fulbright, come back to wherever, uh, find work right away, and uh, going back to live with your folks was just not in the cards, and now it's in the cards, right? And some of you may, may, may uh, think that's a good thing right now, and that's fine. I think that's good. You might think, you know, kind of this time of change, my parents are older. I know in my own house, I've got my wife who teaches also, she teaches at a community college. of my daughter who's back from college taking courses, but uh, my mother and father-in-law live with us and they're, they're 86 and 84. So it's good for us to be together so that we can make sure they're doing well, but it's just not what you expected, right? And now you're thinking, now what I'm supposed to do, right? I have no permanent place to stay. So, so some of you could possibly be in a situation where wherever you are, it's not permanent, right? Maybe you had an apartment before you went on your Fulbright, you gave it up. Uh, maybe you, uh, you just didn't plan to come back. So finding a place to stay is not so easy. I've got college debt and I'm broke. Um, and, uh, you know, everyone who goes on a Fulbright went to college first, right? So you've got this college debt, you're not working, you're broke. So any and all of these feelings may, something that become, that you're feeling at a certain point, right, that, that you're dealing with, right? So how do we kind of turn this around, right? How do we maybe uh, think in a different way, think about um, the, the opportunities that may exist. You know, there's an old expression, when you have lemons, you make lemonade, right, um, of, of the circumstance. So one is, I have time to think more, right? And I, I know that's kind of, well, what does that really mean? But it may be that what you have is a lot of time. And so how can you most effectively use that time to plan and to do things, right? going forward. Maybe I should still do the blog I'd planned. So I said in the first slide, right, you'd planned on writing a blog. No reason why you shouldn't do that, right? So even though you're not teaching in Malaysia right now, are there things that you could still be doing that's a continuation of the Fulbright that still connects you to Malaysia and your students? Nothing prevents you from, from writing a blog. And, I, and I've heard from a couple return Fulbrighters, and actually I also work with the Peace Corps community, so I'm, I work with return Peace Corps volunteers, and they also came back that you're, they're trying to still make some connections to their community, and sometimes it's a matter of writing. I can still connect, stay connected with my students in Malaysia, so can you still be connected to them, right? Is there an opportunity to, to Zoom with them and to talk with them, uh, to find out how they're doing, right? Uh, for you still to provide some, some support, even though you're not technically a Fulbrighter and on a Fulbright experience, but is there something you can still do? Should I make a plan? What should it look like? 
So the question then comes with this time that you're thinking is that, should I make a plan? How do I make a plan, which I'll talk a little bit more in a minute, and what should it look like? You know, what is my plan trying to accomplish, right? I mean, a, a plan is only as good as, as what you're trying to accomplish, you know, and that, whether that plan exceed, succeeds or not. Who should I be talking to right now? So one of the things to think about is that um, uh, people's work life uh, routine has changed. Uh, a lot of people now who had previously been in an office that was uh, kind of busy and they don't really have a whole lot of time to carve out. Maybe in places, maybe they're at home and they've got more time to carve out. Maybe they're in a position to talk. And what I mean by talking now is what I'm really meaning is talking like this, Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, whatever it may be. Uh, who should I be talking to, right? Um, who should I be connecting with? Maybe I can find something short-term to, to do, even delivering groceries, right? So I, I, I think that uh, there's, there is a lot of temporary work out there for people who are willing to do it in specific areas, right? Um, I was reading about contact tracing today that they're gonna be looking for people to do that, right? Um, or delivering groceries, or if you've got a healthcare background, that you can volunteer and do something related to that, making, making uh, surgical, making masks or things of that nature, or working in a food bank or at least supporting a food bank. There are things that you can do and often by doing these things, it makes you feel better about your own circumstance because you feel like you're giving some way to someone, particularly a time like this where there's a lot of need. Maybe grad school. I've, I heard that some schools are offering reduced tuition to recently returned Fulbrighters. So even though we're talking mostly about careers and work, but maybe grad school. And uh, I know uh, Tulane University is the one that I know of that kind of was the first out there, but I think there are other grad schools who are doing things to attract uh, returned Fulbrighters to think about going back to school in the fall. Now, I don't know what going back to school will look like in the fall. Will it be online? You know, how will it look? Uh, but I think uh, even programs are starting to think about waiving the GRE, for instance, or the GMAT, or the LSA, or the uh, the LSAT, or whatever it may be, because you've got this pool of really smart people, such as yourselves, who are coming back, and what can they do? What are my next steps in looking for work? So let's talk about that. So I want to kind of put out six steps here, and then we'll stop, and then we'll spend most of the time just taking questions. Six things that come to mind to me of what you should be thinking about and what you should be doing right now. Uh, a lot of the things that I'm gonna say are really gonna be followed in the next couple sessions. Uh, we have uh, other sessions that the Fulbright Association's got planned that's gonna be looking at specific aspects of looking for work. So the first thing, as I mentioned, is making connections, right? This is really a good time to make connections. And uh, obviously we should be making connections with you know, our family members and, and people that might be vulnerable right now, but we also should be making professional connections. Um, LinkedIn, which uh, I'm sure one of the sessions going forward, we'll talk a little bit more about how to use, um, setting up informational interviews, uh, connecting with people professionally. Like I said, people might have more time to talk. They may they may want to talk themselves. Uh, if, if you're working from home and you're feeling a bit isolated, um, maybe there's a need for you to hear from somebody and for them to ask you questions about how, how your work is and what your work is. So, you know, we often think is that when we do an informational interview, we're burdening somebody. I, 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 I rarely think that's the case. Usually when you do informational interviews with people, uh, the other party is uh, likes the opportunity to kind of share their experiences of what they're doing. So that may be something you want to do also in exploring different pathways. If, if you do uh, apply for jobs right now, this is just kind of like a kind of a warning, right? Um, uh, and something to think about, right? Um, is that uh, clearly there are jobs that are posted out there because it's been such a quick change that a lot of the jobs that actually are not going to be filled, they've been frozen or pulled, may still be posted on websites, right? So if you went to Indeed or Idealist or something like that, and you saw, man, this is the job for me, um, 
before you go down that kind of that rabbit hole on applying, you want to really make every effort you can to go to the organization. I always say go to the organization website first, but go to the HR person and say, look, I'm, I really feel I'm qualified. I'd like to apply. Is the job still being offered? And you may hear back and say, yes, apply. We're meeting virtually. We still have work planned. We have a good budget. We're going forward. But you might hear from other people say, our budget's been frozen. All hiring has stopped. Uh, why don't you get back to me in October or something like that? So you wanna make sure that you're making those connections. And by doing it, actually you're creating a little bit of space to talk to the organization, believe it or not, because I don't think an HR person is gonna be offended by you reaching out just to find it if the, if the position's open or not. And it may be, they might be saying, you do seem like a good candidate. We really do want you to apply. Can you remind me and then come back to us in a couple months when there's no freeze? A lot, a lot of governments like, uh, state of Maryland, I'm in Maryland, there's a hiring freeze. So governments in particular are engaged in hiring freezes. Work on skills and aptitudes online. So we've all said to ourselves, I wish I had time to take blank, right? Uh, you know, uh, I wish I had a time to really bone up on my Spanish. You know, I really would like to work in a Spanish speaking country, maybe Maybe your Fulbright was in a Spanish-speaking country and that was one of your objectives and now you're back home. So why not still spend time boning up on your Spanish online? Uh, can you find a community online that you can speak with? Uh, maybe you really think that uh, you need to be able to, you need no, to know more about social media, for instance, right? Uh, you know, you, you, you'd like to write a blog, but you don't even know how to set up a blog or, uh, maybe you'd like to be doing some other stuff in social media. Can you take a social media course? I, I mean, and courses are not what courses used to be, right? A course could be something two hours on YouTube, but it could also be something that's either asynchronistic, that is you, you, you take it when you take it uh, at a college, like a community, or it could be synchronistic. Maybe you meet once a week online and you're doing something. Now is the time to do this. I, I, and I will tell you for sure that in six months, or whenever it is that we're, we're back to normal or the new normal, you will say to yourself, I wish during the coronavirus crisis, I had done some of these things because now I don't have time to do it. Do those things now, take advantage of online learning. I, one of the things that I say to all of my own graduate students is that uh, financial and technological proficiency is really important. And even though you have a content background that is, you know, you, you, you were teaching English or you were doing this or you were doing that. Uh, do you know how to apply for a grant? If not, take a grant writing course. Uh, do, you, do you know how to use an Excel spreadsheet? You know, something very basic. Uh, now is the time to learn it because when you start looking for work, that's gonna be important. Create good habits and routines. So studies say it takes 66 days to create a habit. And that 43% of what we do in a day is based on habits. And I was kind of struck when I read that myself. That is, uh, that almost half of what I do is I just do it the same every day and I don't even think about it. And that 66 days, it needs to create habits. You've got, to got, you've got to have 66 days to do it. And you've got to have 66 days of consistency. We have now been in this crisis for three weeks, give or take, that's 21 days, right? So what habits are you now starting to create for yourself? You might not even be cognizant of it, right? Maybe you're getting up now and you're meditating every morning that you weren't doing before. Or maybe you're taking a couple walks a day, or maybe you're now calling your, 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 your mother every other day or whatever, whatever it is, you know, you're reading more, you're, you're exercising, you're doing online yoga, whatever it is. These are good habits. How do you keep these good habits going? Because all these habits benefit you when you're looking for work so that when we get back to the normal or the new normal, you can continue that. Now is the time to plant and to create those routines, right? Use this as an opportunity to create good habits, not bad habits. You know, bad habits are like every time I walk by the refrigerator, I open the door looking for something to munch. That's not a good habit, right? A good habit may be you know, getting some exercise or mindfulness or reading or connecting with people or, you know, things that relate to looking for work. You know, I, I always remind people is that your field, whatever it may be, right? Whatever your interests are, there's plenty to read. 
and there's plenty to watch and there's plenty to engage in right now. So maybe that you should do in creating that as a habit. Manage day to day, but create a vision for six months out. So, so what I mean by that is that we have to manage day to day or maybe week to week, all right? We, it's hard for us to say, well, um, this is what I'm gonna do three weeks from now, right? Because we don't really know what the curve of coronavirus is gonna look like in our particular area whether it's gonna be May 1st or June 15th or June 1st or whatever happens that things go back to where they were. So we just have to manage day to day. So set like weekly goals for yourself. So say to yourself, this week, I'm gonna revise my LinkedIn profile. This week, I'm gonna look at my resume. This week, I'm going to schedule two informational interviews. This week, this is what I'm gonna do. And then on Fridays, go back and see that you've done that. You'll have a sense of accomplishment, right? But you should still create a vision for six months out and say to yourself, where do I wanna be in six months? What are some of the things I wanna do? And sometimes creating this vision is something that you can do with your friends and your colleagues. You now have a community, all of, all of you who came back from Malaysia. Can you be working with each other to create a vision, right? Maybe you'll be doing something together in six months. Maybe you can be thinking about that and talking about it. It's something to get you excited about. Common visions are what get people excited about and get them to look forward to something to do. And then finally, take care of yourself and others, right? That's the most important thing. Taking care of yourself, be it emotionally or physically, is really job one. So making sure that you're in tune with who you are, what's benefiting you, what's not benefiting you. Lean on other people. Lean on this community. This community of other Fulbrighters is a great other Fulbrighters who might have come back earlier, other resources, but also help others. And I will tell you the 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 emotional effect of doing something for somebody else is pretty powerful. You probably know that. Or you wouldn't have gone on a Fulbright grant because you wanted to change the world and you wanted to go somewhere else and make a difference. Maybe you can't make a difference with that class of 30, you know, 12 year old Malaysian students right now, but maybe you can still make a difference in your own community with your own family. Now is the time to do that. So make sure you're doing that also. Katie was wondering if there's a database of Fulbright alum by industry and field. Uh, there it is. There's the link, fulbrighternetwork.com. Join the Fulbrighter Network. That may be a way of answering Katie's question about connecting with uh, industry or field. Uh, as I was wondering if you could address how to communicate our Fulbright experience to jobs that may not be familiar with the Fulbright name, what the experience is. Well, I, and, I, and I think that that's, that's a good question. I think that uh, we within the Fulbright community, those people who are in the international education community, uh, people who are in academia and certain fields know Fulbright is a, is a brand, is a branding. And, and we in the Fulbright Association think that that's really important for you all to consider. But I do think that uh, often you're going into environments where there's just saying you went on a Fulbright means nothing. So I really, with my own students and with my own clients, really emphasize talking specifically about what you did and what you did and how that contributes to what you could be doing for somebody else. So if you just say, I went on a Fulbright and that was my, what I did, is not really as valuable as saying, on a Fulbright, I did these things. And these are the ways that I can help you. I've got to tell you, the biggest key to getting a job is not what you know, but what you can do for somebody else. Employers only hire you when you're benefiting them. So a lot of students think, well, I'll learn a lot on this job. Yeah, you probably will learn on this job, but that's not why you're getting hired. You're getting hired because you can do something for somebody. So, so and, and, and even if you've been on a Fulbright for a month, there are things that you've learned and things that you can contribute. Articulate what those things are. Certainly call it in terms of your Fulbright experience, but talk in terms of things that you can contribute to somebody else. How do you suggest we can lever our Fulbright experience for non-government positions? So we're looking at the NGO world, non-governmental organizations, right? Now, one of the things I would say is that non-governmental organizations are more likely to recognize Fulbright as an experience than other types of environments, especially uh, NGOs that do international work, right? And so think about, here's what I understand, think about what got you the Fulbright, right? The things that got you the Fulbright are the things that will get you the job, right? So you got the Fulbright because you had a great idea, you had a great background, you had language, you took certain courses, uh, you had this experience, 
that got you to this point. Those things are the same things. Now, adding the Fulbright, because Fulbright says that the U.S. government, think about this way, or Education, Cultural Affairs, the State Department, think that you are a smart, valuable, articulate, intelligent person. They've said that. It's like, it's like getting a certification for something. Now you take that same thing and make the same case to the, to the NGO. Uh, it, it really is not that difficult when it comes down to it. Think in what got you the Fulbright and think about using that same ability to get you the job. All right, so I'm going back here. I don't see. David, um, I have a yeah, Shaz, uh, yeah, feedback Shaz. on this. Um, yeah, yeah, Shaz. Uh, so St Department of State, federal government jobs give, especially Department of State gives priorities for grantees of their program. So return Fulbrighters would be on their top list of hiring. Sh Shaz, do you know if NCE now applies, is still, is still going to work for these, for these return Fulbrighters, non-competitive eligibility? Yes, I think that I read that somewhere. I should look for that and send it to everyone. Yeah, if you can confirm that. Uh, so non-competitive eligibility. We do have NCE. We got a letter stating that it begins from March 19th when the program ended until March 19th of next year. Fantastic. So NCE actually until recently was not available to Fulbrighters. It was something because I work with the Peace Corps community. Peace Corps volunteers always thought was a really important thing for them because they come back and they get this preference. But now Fulbrighters have it. So what that basically means is that a job has to be, this is US government jobs, and they have to be designated that way, that they uh, either accepting or it's an NCE kind of a job. I think there's some designation that exists there. That basically puts you at the, at the, top, of the top of the list, basically. And in fact, what I'm always told by government people, if this is an NCE job or NCE eligible and you apply, there's not much they can do. They're gonna hire you kind of a thing. Shaz listed uh, globaljobs.org. There are actually a lot of sites out there that you can go to. So, and the problem is, is, you know, a lot of them are very related to each other. So for instance, if you're interested, I work in the humanitarian community. I say, go to Relief Web, right? And look for jobs at Relief Web. If you want to get a job in the development community, go to DevX and look at DevX for jobs. Uh, if you want to get their specific uh, sites for UN jobs and so forth. So a lot of them are really tailored to particular communities. Um, if anybody here wants to reach out to me directly after this, I can kind of direct you to places you might go be, through my own uh, career work. But some of it is, is very specific. But US government, there's only one place to go basically, right? David, it looks like there was also a question about um, the best way to go about asking people for inner, inner Inter yes, yes, I always get that question. So, uh, so p part of it, uh, I, 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 I want to recognize how you might be feeling. You're thinking, uh, here on this 24 year old Fulbrighter just coming back, and you know, who's going to talk to me? Kind of a thing. That's not true. People will talk to you. And so, how do I reach out to an organization? So, the first thing to recognize is that it may be that people know people in an organization. So you've already built a network. This is what LinkedIn is for. You've already know people that you've gotten to know, even if you know them not really well, now's the time to get to know them better. So reaching out to them through LinkedIn or at email. They may recommend to you, hey, why don't you have coffee with my friend such and such, coffee's virtual coffee now, I realize, and talk to them and they do an introduction for you. So what I do with a lot of my students, my students will come to me and say, uh, you know, David, I want to get a job at, uh, you know, this, this non-governmental organization. I say, I think I know somebody that works there. So I introduce that person to that organization and then it happens, right? Now, that's not going to happen every case. Sometimes you just want to go work at a place or look at this or, you know, nobody there. So you should still reach out to them and you go about it in a couple of ways. One is you first have to recognize that their time is limited and valuable. And the tone of the email that you send always recognize, recognize an email is actually best. The, the line, the subject line has got to be very, uh, uh, it's got to be something that they're going to want to open. So for instance, if, if I introduce you to somebody and there's a connection, my name needs to be in that subject line, friend of David Smith's, right? Because then they'll open it. Now, if you don't know anybody, then you've got to say something like, 15 minutes for an informational interview. In other words, you've got to be as specific as, as to what they want. So they're saying, oh, they're only asking for 15 minutes. Then in the email, you've got to be very short and sweet about what you're asking for. 
An informational interview is not asking for a job. It's asking for two things. One is what they do and their experiences and the organization. And it's often best to pose the questions in the email or some of the ideas of the questions. So, dear Mr. Smith, I heard that you do humanitarian work. I'm interested in that. Could I have 15 minutes of your time to ask you about how you got into the field? What are the best humanitarian organizations to work for? And um, you know, what should I be doing right now to find work? Thank you very much. Get back to me when you can. I email like that, I'm gonna get back to you. One is you're, you're asking me very specific questions, right? And you're only asking for 15 minutes of my time. In the interview itself, when you're talking to them, because it's gonna be this way, you need also to be focusing then on those questions. You don't wanna sneak in, oh, by the way, are any, any work there? They will tell you, if they're that 15 minutes, they're impressed with you, they may say, hmm, now I'm thinking, why don't you look for this job or that job? If they don't, doesn't mean they're not impressed with you, it just means no job. The most important thing that you can get out of the information interview is other people to talk to. So at the end of that informational interview, when you're asking the questions, can you say, Mr. Smith, is there anybody else that you would suggest I could talk to? I will send you to somebody else. I absolutely will. It's, I'm almost have a pride in that, that I will say, you know, there's somebody else I need you to talk to. And that person actually may be somebody that could hire you, right? So first of all, recognize, the last thing I want to say about it is that from my vantage point, I'm of a certain age that I want to talk to people of your age, if you're in your 20s and I'm in my 60s, because I'm not going to do what I'm doing forever. I want to bring you into the field. I want to mentor you. You're not competing with me. The future of what I do is in your hands. So it's really in my interest to help you along and to bring you in and to answer your questions. And I think at least in the professional communities that I work with, that's what I see. I see people that think that way and they want to lend a hand when they can, especially at this time. Yeah, so hopefully that answers it maybe a little bit more. Uh, for skill acquisition, you mentioned technical and financial skills are the most important. Do you have specific skills in mind? This is from Kristen. And if so, learning resources that you recommend. Now, why I say this is that uh, people when they're hired today, especially young professionals, it's kind of assumed there are certain things you can do. It's assumed you know how to figure out a budget. It's assumed you can do a spreadsheet. It's assumed that you know something about social media. Uh, it, it, we're kind of in that world now. It used to be those things would be learned or you'd have somebody that does it. But now you're kind of hired as a kind of one all shop, like you should do these things. So I, I definitely say, and it's because what I find is if you have a bachelor's degree and not a master's degree, and you've come back from a Fulbright experience, and you're looking to work in an organization, and a lot of the organizations I work in are kind of governmental, NGO, international, so forth, the most likely jobs that you're going to be uh, qualified for are administrative jobs. It's not going to be, you're not going to be hired as a program manager right away, right? You're going to be hired as a program assistant. And so as a program assistant, you're going to be starting supporting other program managers. You could advance up to that, but you're going to be supporting other people. How you're going to be supporting them is through managing their budgets, organizing their travel, uh, you know, maybe being supporting an event on the back end, maybe from a logistical standpoint. That doesn't mean you can't contribute your language skills and these other skills, but the reality is that that's kind of where you're going to find yourself. So that's why having budget and finance experience, knowing how to write a grant, for instance, especially if you're going to be hired by a not-for-profit becomes really important. To an employer's eyes, how can we communicate the skills that we gained succinctly? Yeah, I think one of the things to think about is that uh, the skills that you have are related to something that you did. So, so in other words, uh, say, you don't say to somebody, I have really good communication skills. You say to them, I use my communication skills in this way. I wrote a newsletter for my Malaysian school uh, and I did that every month and I had to take things that were in Malay. I, used, I knew a little bit of Malay and I translated. So you always describe what you know in, in how you've done it. Right, and so that's what you've got to think about. It's kind of action to results. There's actually a way of 
in a resume, it's, uh, it's A to R. Think about this action and the results that you got and that you did with it. That's what you've got to think about. 